Welcome to episode 11 of the Celtic Whiskey Pod, the home of unchill filtered conversation. I am your host Al Higgins and this week we are heading all the way to Vermont in New England to talk to Irish distiller Daryl McNally. Many of you will know Daryl as former master distiller at the Dublin Liberties Distillery. Earlier this year he left that post and is now in the process of releasing his own whiskey brand named Limavadi. Then a few weeks ago it was announced that Whistlepig Distillery in Vermont have invested in the brand and now we'll see the rollout of the whiskey in the US in the coming weeks before an Irish launch in around November this year. We were keen to find out more about the brand, about the name and the history of distilling in the town of Limavady. What we heard has made us even more excited about the brand, so make sure to listen to the whole of the episode right down to the end to get the lowdown. In this episode, we also talk about Daryl's experience at other distilleries, where his career has taken him from Bushmills to Belfast Distillery Company, and then on to Dublin Liberties Distillery. Being a whiskey maker, he is keen to eventually open a new distillery in Limavady itself which would be a great addition to the industry. For that, we will just have to wait and see. We hope you enjoy this episode of the Celtic Whiskey Pod. Enjoy the unchill filter conversation. I'll be back at the end to summarise. Now, here's Daryl. You're listening to the Celtic Whiskey Pod, the home of unchill filtered conversation. So uh, welcome, uh, Daryl McNally, to the Celtic Whiskey Pod. It's great to see you today and to hear from you. Um, Thanks for joining us. Thanks, thanks for inviting me, Al. It's great, great to be on here talking about uh, Limavady Irish Whiskey. So yeah, looking forward to having a good chat with you. Great. But all things Irish Whiskey and all things Limavady Irish Whiskey. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, since you mentioned it, um, perhaps you can tell us a bit about Limavady because it's a new brand and um, maybe maybe start with the name and how it came about and, and what your connection is to it. Sure, sure. Well, Limavady is actually uh, it's my hometown where I live up in, up in County Derry. So although you know I've worked for for other uh, Irish whiskey companies, that's that's what I call home. Uh, so Limavady is a really really old brand, dates back to 1750, uh, and it actually dates back to an area known as the Route, where the first license was granted mm. to uh, you know to create whiskey, if you like, and it was granted to Sir Thomas Phillips. So Sir Thomas Phillips actually built New Town Limavady as well. Oh, so wow. you know, there was a really big link there between. Sir Thomas Phillips and Irish whiskey and, and, and Limavady Irish whiskey. So it's one of the oldest dating back to 1750, but it's Irish for Leap of the Dog, which uh, essentially was a large Irish uh, wolfhound jump on the River Row to hmm. warn its master about an enemy ambush back in the day. So that's where the name Limavady comes from. It also is quite quite famous for sort of the Danny Boy and uh, the, the Dairy Air, as, as they call it as well. So a lot, a lot of history there. But as I say, uh, first and foremost, it's, it's where I was born and bred. It's where my mum and dad were from. And uh, on my mum's side, the McLaughlins, there's actually was a James McLaughlin who owned the Mavari story back in 1880. Oh, wow. So there's a bit of a link back to the family name. So yeah. uh, I, I, I recall years ago, um, my brother, he, he was a distiller in Bushmills, and I was working for Bushmills at the time. And uh, a far out relative, was a uh, US relative, was actually tracing the family tree. And as we were, uh, we, we met up with them as, as you do to, to reminisce about stories. And it was then that we found out that we actually had a relative that owned the Mavari distillery back in 1880. And here was me and my brother Martin, both sort of distillers or yeah. was running through your veins, if you like. So uh, call it a coincidence or call it, uh, you know, maybe fate, I'm not sure. But uh, <laughs> it was always sort of then that I had in my head, wouldn't it be great to revitalize, to reclaim uh, Limavari Irish whiskey and uh, Sort of fast forward maybe seven years and, and here we are today with uh, the imminent launch of, of Limavady in uh, in America here where I'm wow. uh, and at the minute. <laughs> and so so there was a distillery there. Is there any? Is there much left of that um, particular distillery? No, there was three. Apparently, there was three different distilleries in in uh, Limavady. One of them would have been more like a malt house uh, brewery, which would convert it into a distillery. Then mm-hmm. um, there's some. Uh, sort of leftovers of an old warehouse in Romel Road. And you know it's an old bonded warehouse because you can actually see you know, the bars and the, and the yeah, windows. Yeah. That's off the Romel Road on the right-hand side. Uh, the other distillery that was built was down on the River Row, opposite where Row Park uh, Hotel is and Golf Course. So you can actually see it from the River Row. And then there was one apparently where the old bus station was. So right. I, I actually have a, a close friend and a historian actually tracing the whole history of it and trying to get as much detail as possible. But uh, yeah, dates back to the Alexander family who would have been the prominent family that lived in the Mavadi. 
And uh, I think one of uh, the Alexander uh, daughters married into Sir Thomas Phillips' family. So there's right. another very <laughs> distinct link in, in the history of Irish whiskey yeah. as a category. Uh, so obviously you got whiskey in your blood then some you know it's uh, carried on all this time um so are you able to tell us much about the whiskey itself that you're, you're going to be releasing this year sure sure what i did is i was able to source uh whiskey from from in multiple distilleries i tried to pick you know bourbon finished single malt and then what i did is i did a finish in pedro Jimenez cast so i was able to oh, source yeah. some real quality pedro Jimenez cast uh, what we wanted to do as well is that, you know, there's not a lot of really aged liquid out there in, mm. in the Irish whiskey category now. So I took a sort of four or five year old single malt and then did a nice finish in PX. Not too much, not too overpowering, but just at least a very, uh, you know, a very balanced whiskey and, and lovely sweet flavours, which uh, we're bottling at 46% non chill filtered. And mm. uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's very smooth and very, very easy to drink. So we'll have to get you a bottle to I <laughs> can't wait to try it. I, I do like px finishes and then um, especially when you're in in the kind of slightly younger age profile i think it, it works really well um sure. did you say that's that single malt or is it blend no single malt single, single malt. malt. So what, oh, I'm, what i'm trying to do, stay true to like as you know i work with bush mills which is a single malt distillery yeah. uh you know i have to sort of stay true to uh you know, to the single malt having worked at bush mills and uh, well, the way you look back at the history of of Irish whiskey, I think single malt is the way to go. Mm. Um, and what, what we're trying to do is do a single barrel as well. So each Pedro Jimenez cask that we finish it in, we empty the contents of that into an IBC and bottle it separately. So again, yeah. there's slight differences between one cask of PX and another. So it's great having played and search and develop with that, uh, mm. you know, the different flavors that come out of it. So we very much cask number or barrel number 10, bottle one through to 842 or yeah. whatever it is. It's the large PX butts. Uh, so it's nice from that perspective as well, because you know there'll be slight differences as well, rather than just batching everything together and bottling it off in one. Yeah. So again, we were that's why we're using the single malt, single barrel, because uh, it's not something that many um, Irish whiskey companies have done yet. No. So what we're trying to do is sort of do them about a single malt, single barrel, forty six percent, nice PX finish, and that'll become sort of the first variant. You know, for the next couple of years and then we'll look maybe at doing another variant then let's let's get the show on the road with this one first and <laughs> see how it goes um yeah i, I kind of like the idea it gives gives the whiskies a sort of collectability as well along the light, lines of um kind of two of my favorite scottish distilleries glendronic and ben um yeah. which have a similar i suppose um philosophy towards um manipulating the whiskey and and um releasing it uh, with different finishes and things. Um, what size are those PX casks? Uh, the PX casks are, are 500 litre. 500 oh, right, litre. so proper butts, yeah. Proper yeah. butts, yeah. 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 So um, I, it's, a, it's a company I've dealt with for 20 years who, you know, they have a nice Solero, you know, swapping out the wine and stuff, uh, the process in place in Hereth in southern Spain. So mm -hmm. I was able to source really top quality casks there. And what it does, it gives them a body, you know, a separate dimension. You know, it's rather than it than a, Single dimension, like a lot of other, maybe just bourbon, you know, four year old single malt, has really given a different flavor profile and yeah. actually makes it taste a lot older than, you know, than it actually is. And, yeah. and then with that, it allows us to keep the price point, you know, quite good as well for, you know, for a single malt finished in PX yeah. cast. We're going to be selling in America here for about $49.95. So, you know, it's not, it's not crazy, crazy. Yeah. So, that's, that's good sort of price level to be in that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, now you are not in Ireland right now. You're in uh, sunny Vermont, where the temperature is about 28, 29 degrees. It's uh, yeah. pretty cold and, and windy and slightly wet here in Dublin. So I'm yeah. a bit envious. Uh, so uh, what are you doing in the States right now? You're, you're there for about yeah. six or eight but, weeks. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so as you know, um, you know we, we, uh, we joined up with Whistlepig. So I'm actually at the Whistlepig farm here in Vermont. So it's about three and a half hours north of Boston. So I flew into Boston Saturday night and then traveled up to Vermont yesterday. Uh, and what we are is just sort of beginning to get to know all my uh, my new teammates here at Whistlepig and looking at their distillery operations here, plus dealing with you know, all the different sales guys from, from a Whistlepig perspective and dealing with distributors in the U.S. as we uh, launch Limavati in the U.S. Uh, hopefully tomorrow. And then what I'm doing is I'm going to be traveling through the U.S. for the next probably six, seven weeks uh, into the five launch markets of California, Florida, Arizona, Colorado, and Washington up in the 
the, the West Coast. Yeah. So I'd be traveling the US, um, talking all things about Lima Valley. So it's a, it's a great life talking about your baby. <laughs> flying Valley. around in, in the whistle pig private jet, yeah? I wish. I don't know. <laughs> it's, it's purely economy. I could have said yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, are you in a position to sort of tell us a bit about little? Um, sorry, a bit about um, Whistlepig uh, as well, because I mean, some of our listeners might not. They'll know the name, but they don't really know uh, how they they work as a distillery and distributor. And sure. they've done some great things over the years. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you absolutely. can talk about that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, Whistlepig to me, I've always been watching sort of Whistlepig from afar. Uh, you know, they formed in two thousand and seven, and you know, have released some amazing whiskies under the the Whistlepig. And now they've actually launched a, a six-year-old piggyback as well. Mm. So again, it's built a bit like Lima Valley that's built around the leap of the dog and animal. Uh, the whistle pig was built around, uh, you know, the pig called Mortimer's. So that's where the whistle pig came from. And then they have lots of sort of aged whiskies, a lot of sort of single barrels and, you know, special cask finishes. And they've had, a, you know, an, an all around the rye American whiskey sort of side yeah. of things. So if you look out around the fields here, there's, you know, there's three or four hundred acres, five hundred acres, I think it is, and they've just harvested the rye, oh, wow. uh, which is which is amazing, you know. So they keep keeping it all in house and building it in the farm or, or growing it in the farm. So yeah, uh, a very award winning rye whiskey, uh, and as I say, it was it was extra special when the you know we we got to talk. We always sort of kept in touch at some of the whiskey shows and whatnot, but to share some of the very similar values of whistle pig and, and what I wanted for them Valley. It uh, became apparent very quick that you know we should join forces and and Whistle Pig have said you know that the Irish whiskey in America is on fire so that yeah. again is a testament to you know, the Irish whiskey category so yeah so we got got our heads together and, and did a deal for you know for Lima Valley to join join the Whistle Pig family and really happy with that <laughs> because you know the the way you know, the way the board and the way Jeff Kozak the CEO and Alex Roberts the CFO the way they thinks very much in line with what you know I feel is important for for Lima Valley and. We joined up quite quickly and got a deal done. And here we are, yeah. just about to launch it in the US. <laughs> uh, that's excellent. That sounds re- really exciting. Uh, it's at a time for you to be there. Um, yeah, so rye whiskey and uh, whistle pig is a big thing. Do you think there's um, a future for Irish rye whiskey somewhere along the lines? Well, I think, yeah, I think a couple of the players have done it. I know, uh, I know that Cooley Distillery would have done it. Uh, Maybe Bushmills yeah. have tried it, but as I say, it's, it's a tough, it's a tougher uh, cereal to work with as well. Oh, yeah. It was quite hard and sticky as well. So you need to make sure that your distillery is, is catered for it. You know, it's, it's process equipment can cater for it. But I think, yeah, it's, a, it's an amazing taste in whiskey. And it's something that, that as Irish moves into more innovation, it's definitely something that, that I think people will, will, will get into. Yeah. You're listening to the Celtic Whiskey Pod. The home of unchill filtered conversation. So, uh, are there any plans to build a, a Limavady distillery? Yeah, I think what, what we wanted to do is, like, as I say, my first phase of, of sort of Limavady was to, you know, to get the product out there and to get a, you know, a partner such as Whistlepig. So, that was sort of phase one. Um, you know, we don't want to be silly either. We want to be real about things. You know, the brand needs to build mm. at a certain point before. You know, it would justify building a distillery. So, yeah, uh, I'm I'm not saying never, but definitely we want to launch Limavady and see how it goes. You know, with sourced whiskey, uh, pretty much like what we, we did for you know the Dublin or Dublin Liberties Distillery. We got the brands moving, and then that justified building a distillery. Yeah. Now, I would love to build a distillery up at home in Limavady. Absolutely, it's definitely something that I have on my to do list. But <laughs> as I say, we need to be real about it too. You don't want to be using you know unnecessary cash now that could be used into building the brand so we're yeah. we're, we're being grown up about it we've been grown up about <laughs> it but when you know if Lima Valley takes off the way we hope and pray uh then definitely uh, we wouldn't be looking at the distillery at a later date for sure yeah yeah and um I'd, talking about building distilleries you've had had some experience vast experience over the years um in in probably places that have been more challenging than your average distillery uh, sure. to work on so you you did some work with belfast distillery which is the the crumb and jail one yeah and uh obviously dublin liberties both in historic buildings <laughs> um maybe maybe if you're able to talk to us a little sure. bit about yeah, yeah, yeah. How, how do you go about putting a distillery into a historic building is it sure. absolutely the worst thing to do that's why i have great hair all that's why i have great hair you won't believe i'm only 21 no i'm only joking uh <laughs> So, no, like as I said, I worked at Bushmills for 17 years and 
during that time, uh, you know, as distillery manager, master distiller, we, you know, we were building front end to back end during the Diageo days, you know, where Diageo yeah. was coming in to, to upgrade in the process equipment. So that sort of gave the first sort of process of, of CapEx expenditure and, and, and upgrading bush mills, you know, with extra still in the, the still house and you're dealing with building warehouses and all that good stuff. So it was a real growth period in bush mills and I was mm-hmm. there for it. So that, that sort of gives you a good background onto what was needed. Then, as I say, I was, was asked to go to Belfast to design and still in the Common Road Jail. Uh, for various reasons, that didn't really work out. So um, I was then asked by Quintessential Brands to, to come and get a site in Dublin and build a site, a building a still right in the centre of Dublin, which, which we did. It opened in February 19. So, yeah, mm-hmm. trials and tribulations of building a story in a greenfield site versus right in the middle of a city. I can assure you it's, uh, it's definitely uh, difficult. And we were trying to get everything in when the roads, when everything was happening during the day in a busy city. So yes, it, it, it had its trials and tribulations. And as I say, it was squeezing a lot of equipment into a small area. And again, then making it economically viable as well, you know, from an output and so on and so forth. So yeah, so we did that at, at, at Dublin and built a you know, smashing distillery there. Uh, and uh, yeah, and then as I say, I sort of turned 45 and I thought, you know, I always really wanted to do Namavari in the back of my mind. And if it had left it any longer, it probably wouldn't have. So I yeah. said, right, I want to I want to try and do my own brand and bring them a value out and, and uh, tell the story about the family links and all that good stuff. And, and here 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 we are now. So and I, don't, <laughs> and I don't mind if we need to build a story for them a value, don't worry, I'll 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 have plenty of uh, dark hair here to play on the other side. <laughs> uh, just make sure you've got a building that's that's big enough and doesn't have any uh, historic walls and exactly. windows. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, yeah. yeah, I I think um I'm not not 100% sure, but I think Dublin Liberties Distillery are, are back open for visitors, perhaps. Um, and it's, it's definitely worth uh, having a look around because everything is shoehorned in there quite remarkably, um, yeah. how, how everything goes. If it's not open, it will be open soon, I, I assume. But um, yeah, it's quite impressive to see how everything fits in there. Uh, yeah. That must be a good challenge. Like two, two ton mash ton, and you know, it's got. You know, a, commercial output if you like so it's not just a toy like you know it's a yeah. commercially viable distillery and as i said it looks amazing some nice stills and all they're nicely lacquered on from card <laughs> so yeah it's a great great distillery yeah i'm very proud of it yeah yeah and uh you'll probably be looking forward to trying some of the the whiskies once they're they mature um knowing that's your your own handiwork <laughs> that's, it, that's it so we'll be looking forward to we open sort of february 19 uh so yeah we're starting to sort of taste maybe uh, early next year, just to see how it's coming along. But the malt spirit from it was was delicious. Like so, uh, I really hope that that uh, it takes a few boxes and wins a few awards. Would be great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah it's certainly a, an exciting time to be an Irish whiskey enthusiast because we have that first, or would you call it second wave? I think mm-hmm. it's kind of really the second wave of distilleries we're in now, where we're going to start see um, mature whiskey from a whole bunch of other. Um, kids on the block and uh, yeah very exciting to compare and contrast all those different methods of production um, you know single pot still versus single malts you know what's going to be the champion for Ireland um, yeah yeah, very interesting to see good fun yeah definitely will be good fun being being Um, a malt being a malt purist me like you know so have to uh, ward off all the pot still uh, people you know so (laughs) I, I always say it's all it's, it's it's a credit to the Irish whiskey category, whether it's pot still, you know, green or single malt. Uh, you know, it, 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 all all we want as a group of, you know, is for the category to grow uh, across the world, which it is, which is brilliant. Yeah, and um, yeah, you mentioned grain there as well. There are some fantastic grain whiskies coming out of Ireland, which is, is uh, quite unique amongst the world because yeah, I think you try with grain whiskies from other countries and they're usually disappointing, but. Um, yeah, some great stuff coming out of Ireland. No, um, you you're in a kind of unique position because you can really kind of see what U.S. market is is doing at the moment. Are you involved in other markets? Uh, sort of like everyone's talking about China at the moment as well as a 
huge um, potential. Great to uh, talk to Podrick whiskey. and learn all about yeah, Pachin well, as early days for the distillery, distillery but we can't, we can't wait to try their whiskey when it finally story, matures. So From what yeah, they are saying, the base spirit is very good, so they are definitely mammoth, worth watching for uh, in the future. In the meantime, you can of course buy the authentic Mikkel Pachin, which is made using the family recipes and bog bean. You'll find them on our website, CelticWhiskeyShop.com, where the standard recipe retails for $38.99, whilst the heritage edition made from peaty oats and barley retails for 55 euros. We didn't discuss it, but there's also an excellent gin made at Mikkel, and this contains bog bean along with other Connemara botanicals and flowers. It retails for 48 euros and recently gained a silver medal at the 2021 World Gin Awards. That's all from me for now. Thanks again to everyone at Mikkel Distillery and to Podrick for sharing his knowledge with us. Thanks to Luke from the Celtic Whiskey Bar and Larder. Slancha for now. Absolutely, I think it's a it's a it's it's a good opportunity for sure. Yeah, and you kind of would you be confident that all the new Irish distilleries that are cropping up would have the, you know the markets to sell their whiskies in? I always I said this maybe a few years back when I was interviewed. And, you know, I, I I do really do worry about some of the smaller distilleries and, and distribution and so on and so yeah. forth. The doors open because you, you know the more you make the brings your cost down and makes it more competitive and all that good stuff. So, um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, we're partnering up with Whistlepig here in the U.S. You know, it's, you know, to me, that keeps me from lying awake in bed at night, you know, you're sort of yeah. distribution and having talked to RNDC and, and uh, Breakthrough as distributors in America, you know, just put the hairs up the back of my neck to be able to, to deal with them and the numbers yeah. they were saying for Limavati over the next sort of one, two, three, four or five years. Uh, you know, just really made me smile from ear to ear. So, so you know, distribution is so key to it. You know, the product, how it looks, the taste. Yeah, of course, it's very important. But if you're not getting it out there to sell, you know, it's it's tough. You know, so, so yeah, yeah, it's the hardest part of the job, I think. And, uh, Absolutely. If you can get someone else to do it, like yeah. Whistle Pig, then yeah. that's yeah. the ideal situation. Um, yeah, you mentioned sort of how some distilleries might. Um, struggle. I I had a, a really interesting chat with uh, Frank McCarty from Springbank, and he kind of explained there. Well, he was ex Springbank, you know, um, but he kind of worked in there during the doldrums and the glory years, and he came up with a, a very good sort of way of looking at it. It's like only make as much whiskey as you want to sell, um, and I, I think that's fine for yet yeah, the smaller Irish distilleries. I think you know the the, the wee guys would probably be fine if they're just limiting themselves to to sort of small production but it's it i mean i suppose what i'm trying to say is that the medium-sized distilleries are the ones that maybe find the, the bigger challenges you know because they don't have huge amounts of money behind them but they need to find uh channels into international markets to yeah. sell their wares i think it's that debate whether you know, do you lay down more stock or do you put money into developing your brand and you know, you have yeah. to play into building the brand in order to need the stocks. And it's, it's, it is a catch-22, and it's it's an art in itself to sort of balance the books and what's the best way best way to go about it. But uh, Frank McCarty, he's actually ex. He, he worked at Bush Mills back in the day as well. Oh, yeah, he would have been there when you were there yeah. as well. Yeah. No, 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 he was before, it was before my time. But, but Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. He, he had the reins at Bush Mills as, as, as a <laughs> distiller as well. So uh, yeah. a, le- a legend of a man. He is, yeah, and we're still tasting some of those whiskies you made in those days. Uh, some of the the more unusual ones have uh, made their pass into other other bottlings outside of Bushmills, which is interesting to see. Um, what uh, what do you think of the new Bushmills uh, Causeway collection? Have you tried those whiskies? I, ha- I haven't tried them. I've, I've seen them on your know, social media and whatnot. And they look they look amazing, but they're quite hard to get your, your hands on them. You know, so uh, yeah, even even. <laughs> Uh, having worked there in the past, it's, it's, it's still difficult to get a, to get a chance to get a drink at it. So maybe better to come down to the Celtic whiskey shop and uh, get a few samples put out there. That's maybe the only way you can. We'll get see it. what we can do. Um, yeah. yeah, I think at this stage you have to have your finger on the trigger in an auction to to get hold yeah. of some of them. But um, yeah, they, they are, it, they're excellent whiskies. Yeah. I think it's great. I think it you know sort of uh, brought brought Bushmills back. To, you know some of the stuff that it's done in the past. Yeah. Um, there's some great liquid there as well for you know for to do this sort of thing so so yeah uh great great to see yeah i we had helen well holland on uh for the yeah. podcast and um i think any irish enthusiast um was kind of relieved and sort of finally to see uh whiskies that we knew 
we're at Bush Mills, um, but we're just waiting for them to be released. And some of them took longer than others. But um, yeah, uh, I think it, there's a bit more excitement about the distillery these days uh, than uh, that, there was. Hell, uh, Helen's great, great at her job, you know, great, great girl. So uh, yeah, yeah it's, uh, that's, that was my, my Bush Mills family and we still keep in touch. Yeah, so it's, Excellent. Uh, it's all good. <laughs> and your brother works there now. Is my that right? Works, my brother works there, but uh, he's actually come to, to work for Limavati as well because, as I say, ah. it's his family as well. And, yeah. you know, and you know, he wants to try and bring that in. But again, the two of us coming from Bush Mills very much love Bush Mills and everything to do with it. It's just this Limavati has dealt us an opportunity to come and you know, launch your own. And we're sort of grabbing it with two hands and, and uh, taking it back to the family. Like, you know, so the ancestors will be turning their graves or smiling down at us to say, you know, thanks for <laughs> relaunching. We're old uh, whiskey brands, you know. So that's uh, yeah. Um, are, are, are there other distilleries that you kind of are uh, whiskey makers that you admire at, at the moment that you know you think are doing a particularly good job? No, well, I think like I like I like the whole Waterford story. I like you know that terroir and you know uh, dealing with different uh, uh, farmer suppliers. Uh, yeah. yeah. So like I, I think that's great. I like Connor Kelpie. I like the way you know, what they're doing down in Connor Kelpie as well. You know, you admire a great northern distillery as well for, you know, t- turning that brewery into, you know, a, a big supply centre for whiskies as well. And yeah, yeah lots lots of admiration for uh, many distilleries across across Ireland. You look at West Cork distillers as well, you know, the, the huge amount of, uh, you know, CapEx expenditure they put into to, to their site. So, yeah, you have to you have to give credit where credit's due. It's it's definitely, you know, step change in every two, three, four years, which is great to see. Yeah. I haven't been in Irish whiskey now for 23 years, essentially half my life. You know, it's so nice just to see, you know, which went from three distilleries now to all these other ones that have sort of matured now, you know, from their infancy of, of design and build now into to something great that, that the category can be proud of. Yeah. yeah. And uh, that's a great thing to, to see across the industry as well, where th- there's a kind of friendly rivalry, but it's not really, uh, there's no enemies. And uh, with all these diverse and great distilleries doing different things it all adds to the whole image of irish whiskey um which is great um what uh, do you think there are sort of new trends or anything that we can expect to see in irish whiskey going forward well i think i think you know what people wanted to do was to get you know the the backbone of the irish whiskey category up and running to give variety to the consumer because you know the more variety that we've sort of given over sort of the last four or five years what it has done is sort of boosted the demand, if you like, for Irish whiskies and for you know, the, the differences now between, you know, you would have got a Jameson and a Tullamore and a Bushmills before, and now you have, you know, Teelan and you know, Dublin yeah. and that good stuff. So it gives it gives a variety and really puts the category on the map and gives the consumer a choice. And, uh, you know, the change in consumer now is very much wanting to try new things, whether it be food or drink. So, and Ireland yeah. is always... You know, anybody you talk about Irish food or drink around the world, and it's seen as premium quality, you know, top end. You know, you know from a from the meat to the milk to the creams to the you know to the whiskey. So, so you know <laughs> that that's gathered base around the world, and it can only be good for for Irish whiskey and, and, and good for for the category in a whole. Yeah, um, I, I'm Scottish, and obviously I I like Scottish whiskey, but yeah, there's talk about Irish whiskey potentially overtaking. Uh, Scotch whiskey in certain markets. Do you think that's going to happen? Yeah, I mean, well, I think you know, having you know, having just done the deal here with Whistlepig and you know them bringing on Limavady, you know, a few of a few other big American whiskey companies are looking at Irish sort of first and foremost. So that sort of tells tells its own story. And in, in, in my eyes, that you know, Irish in America mm-hmm. seems to be absolutely on fire. So you know, when you have the players over here who's got you know maybe much more distribution and relationships, you know, than than what we went from Ireland with with US distributors, it's nice to see that that, that Irish is on fire and that you know whistle picker uh, you know investing in and, and you know, coming into Irish whiskey. So yeah. that speaks for itself, I think. Of course, everyone in America has some sort of Irish <laughs> connection, so it seems you know yeah. um, we have people coming in the shop who tell us, "Yeah, I am, I'm Irish," and it's like, yeah. "Oh, really? Where are you from?" It's like. <laughs> I always say there's seven million Irish people in Ireland and seventy million across the rest of the world. So <laughs> yeah, um, that bodes well for the industry. Um, yeah, so the launch in Ireland for for Limavady, we can expect yeah. that this year and yeah, November. Yeah, we expect to, to launch in November. 
Uh, so say we wanted just to give America the five states of America, sort of the time time now. Uh, and then, as I say, I've, I've organised a bottler in Ireland and yeah, hope to get the labels in now to get them approved and stuff. So yeah, hope to launch November in, in Limavady somewhere, hopefully. And, Excellent. Uh, uh, put, put Limavady in the map as well, up in that sort of northwest coast, where it's very scenic and very beautiful. Uh, not, not too far away from Bushmills, but 20 miles away from Bushmills. But again, just to you know, to a lot of people from business businessmen in Limavady thank me for launching Limavady because it's really you know, brought back that, that sort of historic and history and heritage, and uh, hopefully it'll help you know from a, uh, a tourist point of view and stuff up in that area. Yeah. When and if we ever get to, to build a distillery and a visitor center, so so yeah, it's uh, it's nice. Yeah. Nice to we, we have a few a few people up around that way who creating distilleries, and so you could have your own little. Uh, um, what would you call it? Uh, tour of um, Antrim, yeah. something like that. Whiskey, yeah. whiskey, whiskey Trail, yeah. We could do, you yeah. could do leave, leave there from Donegal over into Limavady, over into Bushmills, and then on around into Belfast and, and to, yeah. Yeah, yeah, loads of distilleries up there, which would be great. Um, did I hear that Belfast Distillery is, is back on track now? Is that a, a thing? Do you know? I'm not sure now, but I, I, I believe so. I hear, I hear that. We had to go back to planning or something, but I hear there, you know, things are moving there. So it'd be great to yeah. see that project, uh, you know, take off, and it'd be great to see a distillery in the jail. Yeah, so yeah, <laughs> the noise is the uh, like you say the rumors are, are positive, which is great. So yeah. yeah, great place for a lock in. Oh god, yeah, a bit of, <laughs> bit of history there, you know. So uh, there's the, there was always a story about one of the cells, the, the the dog, the prison warden, and the dog wouldn't the dog wouldn't pass the cell, so it's just the ghostly uh, activities that are there. So definitely wouldn't want to be doing a night shift in the mash house and stuff like <laughs> that one. Yeah, yeah, that'd be a bit spooky, all right. <laughs> um, so uh, I think that's everything we, we need to talk about, um, Daryl. Yeah. Um, it'd, it'd be great when uh, we're closer to November, we maybe could have another chat anyway and, uh, when we're closer to launching them about it. And I'll keep you posted on how things are doing in the US as we launch it over the next six weeks. Absolutely. Enjoy your, your tour around the States and uh, the good weather. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> um, and thanks for joining us on the, the Celtic Whiskey Pod. Um, no problem. But that we will speak again soon. We, we might try and get you in for a tasting if you're, you're launching uh, later in the year. So, yeah, uh, thank you very much. That'd be great. Thank you very much, Al. All the best. Cheers, Daryl. Bye. Bye. You're listening to the Celtic Whiskey Pod, the home of unchill filtered conversation. So there you have it. It sounds like Limavady whiskey will hit all the right buttons for us. Quality spirit, single casks, PX finished and a good price point mean that it'll most likely be a success. We can't wait to try it later this year. We wish Daryl the best of luck in the US where the appetite for Irish whiskey shows no sign of abating. So thanks Daryl and thanks to Whistlepig from where he was calling us. Look out for another episode of the Celtic Whiskey Pod soon. Don't forget to like and subscribe wherever you stream your podcasts from. Slancha and goodbye for now. Mm-hmm.